the most important thing to me is realizing that you know you can have intellect you can have aptitude and you have to have a whole lot of luck as with all things but at the end of the day what drove my success and continues to drive my success and the success of others is curiosity because if you're not really passionate about it and you're not really curious you'll may you may learn what it takes to get that next promotion or that next kind of achievement under your belt but if you're truly curious and you're truly passionate about something it doesn't feel like work. Everybody, welcome to Impact Theory. You are here, my friends, because you believe that human potential is nearly limitless, but you know that having potential is not the same as actually doing something with it. So our goal with this show and company is to introduce you to the people and ideas that will help you actually execute on your dreams. All right, today's guest is the youngest person in history to achieve nuclear fusion. At the age of 14, on a unit that he began building in his parents' garage with pieces he cobbled together from discarded parts, the internet, and uranium he mined by himself, he managed to smash together atomic nuclei at such high velocity that he achieved temperatures 40 times greater than the core of the sun, becoming only the 32nd person in human history to do so. By the time he was in high school, he had acquired a deep base of knowledge in at least 20 fundamental fields of science and engineering, including physics, chemistry, radiation, meteorology, and electrical engineering. By the time most kids are getting their driver's license, he'd invented the world's cheapest neutron detector, designed to stop terrorists from smuggling in a dirty bomb, won the Intel Foundation Young Scientist Award, won a Teal Fellowship, and developed a medical device that created diagnostic medical isotopes that dramatically lowered the cost of cancer detection. And since then, he's designed a radically new version of a nuclear power plant that he believes is far cheaper and safer than current plants. And if he's right, the implications are far-reaching. The U.S. Undersecretary of Energy, Christina Johnson, said that someone like him comes along only once in a generation. As such, in 2017, he was named to the Helena Group, a global think tank aimed at tackling some of the biggest problems that we face as a civilization. Please, help me in welcoming the man Time Magazine called the next Einstein, vice correspondent and nuclear physicist, Taylor Wilson. Up, How you doing? Uh, how's it going? Yeah, good, man. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh yeah, uh, you bet. <laughs> researching you was madness. Uh, so yeah. creating nuclear fusion seems out of the realm of possibility, I think, for certainly for myself, and I'm going to guess for 99.99999% of the people watching this show, what's the secret Oof. to doing the impossible? I don't know. Interesting hobbies, I guess. I, um, I just, I decided I wanted to do it, right? And that's kind of always been my personality. If I decided I wanted to do something, I was going to do it. And um, so I, I don't know, I got into nuclear science when I was 10 years old and decided that there had to be a way for me to kind of access those nuclear reactions. And the easiest way to do that seemed to be to build a nuclear fusion reactor. So just took a few years of amassing the knowledge that required to actually do it. So... I can believe, and I think most yeah. people can believe, that they, if they set their mind to it, that they can achieve it, but they don't necessarily know the process to go through to acquire the knowledge. What, what does that step-by-step -step process look like for you? Yeah, I mean, for me, of course, like, it helped that I was incredibly, like, passionate about it. Like, I was obsessed with this stuff, so I was basically sucking up every little ounce of knowledge I could, and, you know, being a child of the internet, 10 or 15 years earlier, what I did probably wouldn't have been possible, right? I grew up in, in Arkansas and the, the kind of 10 or 15 years earlier, information I would have had access to was what is, is available in the local library. Mm. Um, so having the access to the internet and being able to email, you know, physicists kind of and engineers all over the world um, was very helpful. And for me, my kind of personal kind of learning experience was studying the history of it. I, I, I really believe the best way to learn about a topic is to learn the history. Because even something as complex as, say, quantum mechanics, which is very like non-intuitive, it's counterintuitive, um, can be understood if you understood the motivations of the people who came up with the theory, right? It was it was a pretty logical uh, stepping process of going from this concept to this concept to this concept. And even though you end up with something that's very esoteric and weird and counterintuitive, it was just kind of guys that probably weren't that much smarter than you 
making the logical leap between one theory to another theory. And so by studying the history of nuclear science from kind of the earliest experiments that demonstrated that there were these fundamental building blocks of nature called atoms to being able to actually break down those atoms into their components, the electrons and the nucleus with neutrons and protons. You know, those experiments I very kind of closely followed in, in what I did and the experiments that I did when I was, you know, between probably 11 and, and 14. <laughs> so I read the book, The Boy That Played With Fusion, yeah. and which was a book written about you for everybody at home. Uh, it's so surreal to hear the, th like, because he tells the book out of order, right? So sometimes he's yeah. like flash forward and it's sort of you contemporary and then he'll mm -hmm. flash back and it's you as a kid. And I would lose, like for a minute, I'd be thinking, oh, you're making these um, homemade fireworks, but you're probably in your teens. And then I'd realize you were like nine. Yeah. So no. uh, like, when did you get comfortable with playing with things that are either radioactive or explosive? Was Good that- Good question. I, I became comfortable and I think my parents didn't. <laughs> so- <laughs> What a shock. Um, I mean, I was always interested in stuff that, you know, what, for better or worse was kind of a little bit volatile. Like, so um, as far back as I can remember, I was interested in science, but before nuclear science, um, I was interested in rocketry and space science, and I wanted to build rockets. So part of that was studying energetics, right? Energetic materials, things like um, oxidizer fuel mixtures, things that go into rocket fuel that you know that can explode. And um, I've always kind of had a personality um, that's fairly cautious, which kind of seems weird because I play around with nuclear material yes. and explosives and dangerous chemicals. But I realized pretty early on that if I wasn't incredibly careful. I wouldn't be able to do that every day and, and make it you know, as far as I have. Now, going back to the notion of um, I want to follow the history and I want to figure this out, yep. if you were to embark on something new today, do you literally go to Google and type in the history of whatever you're about to do or? Um, well, it's a process, right? So, um, you know, for me, learning a new topic, which I like to do pretty regularly, you know, I'm, I'm really lucky that I get to apply something, nuclear science, to a lot of different fields. So depending on the day of the week, I'm working on energy or I'm working on a medical application or I'm working on an engineering project. And in that way, kind of every day, I get to learn something new uh, about a different topic. And, um, but yeah, to go back to that point, uh, partly it's, it's, it's getting the overarching kind of uh, uh, themes of the field. And then for me, kind of digging into the personalities, right? So who were the people that made the discoveries? What was their training? What was their background? You know, some of the greatest discoveries in science happened from people that weren't necessarily in their own field, but just kind of at the edge of their field, right? So a biologist that was kind of dabbling in material science. You talked about how a lot of Nobel Prizes were given to people that were either right at an intersection or actually well outside of their field. Why do you think that is? Well, I think we all get into a sense of, of thinking this is the way things are and this is how they've always been. And it gets you into a kind of a rigid structure of thinking, right? And, and, and partly that's a consequence of human psychology. Partly that's a consequence of the way science is taught. Um, but if you're a biologist, you're taught this is what we know about biology. And you might can investigate a new, you know, probe deeper into a certain area or probe a new area, but it's usually when someone takes kind of a paradigm shift or takes a little bit of knowledge from an external field and applies it, and it's something no one's ever thought before, right? Because your, your average biologist doesn't know about the latest discoveries in material science. He, he just doesn't. That's not what a biologist's job is. But if he's able to take that discovery and be like, wow, I wonder if this effect, this force is the reason that you get this binding and this, this molecule, um, maybe that's the reason that you know, X happens. And so I, I, I do fundamentally believe that the best scientists, the best engineers, the best innovators are ones that are able to take their knowledge and apply it to other fields or take knowledge from an external field and, and bring it into an area where it hasn't really been applied before. Do you ever feel like your own thinking gets in a rut on a given problem? Oh, absolutely. What do you do to address that? You can't help but have that happen, right? And um, partly for me, it's going out and talking to other folks that are um, doing other things, right? So 
I'd say, you know, in my day job, I, I spend a lot of time meeting nuclear physicists and nuclear engineers and, and folks with that background. But I s try to spend, you know, a certain amount of time um, talking to folks that are just radically different than me, right? Um, you actually seek them out? Yeah, yeah. I go, whether it's to an academic institution, a university, uh, Department of Energy National Lab, um, a, a company, you know, within industry, and, and try to talk to folks that are doing really different things than what I'm working on in hopes that they might have a solution that I can apply to one of my problems or vice versa, you know, that I have developed something that might could apply to their, their area or their problem set. Mm -hmm. I imagine now that's a lot easier for you. You've got so much credibility yeah. behind you. You're really well known in the space. Take us back to when A, you're not known in the space. Yeah. B, you probably sound like the nine year old that you yeah. are. Like, how do you call people, convince them? Yeah. Like, what is that process? Because people struggle even to get a mentor. Yeah. Like, how did you yeah. how did you find mentors? How did you convince people to give you equipment? Like, right. Well, and you're right, that was a struggle. Basically, until I achieved nuclear fusion, right? Um, there's a, there, I guess you call it a credibility gap, right? Like people are like, well, why, you know, why am I talking to this kid? You know, what, what is, what does he know? Um, but I also have a personality where, you know, and I, I might have said this before, you know, if, if I set out to do something, I, I pretty much do what it takes to, to make it happen. And so, um, and sometimes it's just being bold. Like I don't think most, you know, PhD uh, nuclear physicists or nuclear engineers, say a professor at a university or a director of a lab gets very many emails from a 10 year old. Um, and so partly it's just being bold enough to do it. And then for me, you know, if I could get in the room with them, I, I, you know, try to convince them that I sort of know what I'm talking about at least. And do you prepare? Like, do you, if you know you're about to meet somebody, do you prepare ahead of time? So you go in and like, you know who they are and what their hot buttons are, or is it just, you're so passionate about what you're doing that you want to convey that? Yeah, no, I, and, and it's not even maybe that I'm trying to convey anything. I'm just, I love what I do. Like, I love this stuff. I love nuclear science and science in general. And so being able to be in the room with someone who has knowledge about something that I don't is the best feeling in the world. Being able to, you know, absorb that knowledge from them, you know, that transfer, that um, osmosis of, uh, of, of knowledge. I, I think that is one of the best experiences in the world. So if I have the opportunity to be in the room with someone who knows a whole lot about a subject, that's, I'm in my element, I, I really enjoy that. Let's say that 100 people wanted you to mentor them. You obviously can't mentor them all. Mm -hmm. What would you look for? Like people ask me all the time how to get a mentor. Yeah. So what's your answer to that question? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a few answers I guess I'd have to that, but the most important thing to me and something that's been you know, incredibly helpful to me over the years is realizing that you, know, you can have intellect, you can have aptitude, and you have to have a whole lot of luck as with all things, but at the end of the day, what drives, I think, what drove my success and continues to drive my success and the success of others is curiosity, right? Being passionate, passionately curious about a subject, right? Because if you're not really passionate about it and you're not really curious, you'll may, you may learn what it takes to do something or you may learn what it takes to get that next promotion or that next kind of achievement under your belt. But if you're tr truly curious and you're truly passionate about something, it, it doesn't feel like work, right? You'll do what it takes to become good at something. And so I always get excited when I meet students or people that contact me and they're just incredibly passionate, right? Because with that passion, they can learn what it takes to be you know, good at science and good at innovating and good at you know, engineering. If you were gonna give somebody two or three bullet points, because I'll assume that the people that, are, that even know who you are, yeah. like they're, they're gonna have a level of enthusiasm and passion for yeah. this. So beyond that, like what becomes the next filtering criteria? Like for me, I'll mm -hmm. tell you right now, if the person doesn't have the grit and tenacity that you've talked about, yep. like that's, Huge, but now, like, how do you convey that to somebody, right? I don't, I can't yeah. detect it in an interview, which means that yeah. I, have you seen Fight Club? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Fight Club, they make them stand outside the door for right. four days in the rain, right? So right. I'm always trying to think, like, what's my version of that? Because I want to know, is the person going to stick with it? Right. Um, well, you're completely right about that. I mean, passion can only take you so far. I, I do find, though, that folks that have passion, that takes them the extra, you know, the extra distance to become good at something. Um, you know, for me, when I meet someone, you know, whether it's someone I'm interviewing to hire them or be a student, you know, in, in that kind of mentor relationship, um, aptitude is important, but not that important. Um, finding if they're passionate, finding if they have 
taken the time to learn about the subject. They don't have to be an expert in the subject, but if they've taken the time to at least get a basis in what they're talking about, um, I think that's important. You know, there's a lot of people that, um, and to some degree, I was that person. You know, before I found nuclear science, I was interested in biology, I was interested in space science, I was interested in rocketry, I was interested in all these different fields. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I think you know, you sometimes bump around things until you finally find the thing that sticks. And maybe it goes to what you're saying about grit and tenacity. You know, finding someone who's really stuck with something long enough to really you know, get a grasp for it. Maybe not become an expert, but at least kind of know what they're talking about. That's usually a good kind of dividing line between I think the people that have the, you know, the right stuff and the people that may still be finding, you know, what they want to do. Um, but yeah. All right. You said something that literally the brake screeched in my brain. Okay. Aptitude matters, but not that much. Yeah. People watching right now, I promise they're thinking this guy did nuclear fusion yeah. at 14. Like he's just a genius. Do yeah. you consider yourself a genius? Um, I don't know. I look. I I think uh, I probably do have some natural aptitude for science, just like some people have natural aptitude for you know music, a musical ability, or writing, or all these things. But that's never been to me what set me apart. Right? There are a lot of smart people in this world. To me, it was just being profoundly curious. Right? Because. Um, you know, if you're, it's kind of the difference between learning something in the classroom or outside the classroom, right? If you're forced to take a class on philosophy, right? You have to get that credit uh, to graduate. Um, and you sit in that class, you're probably not going to become an expert in philosophy, right? There's just, the, there's not the motivation there to become good at it, um, no matter how much natural aptitude you, you may have. And in that way, you know, if you're truly passionate about something like I was in nuclear science, it never felt like learning, right? And so I was able to put in the, you know, however many, you know, tens of thousands of hours it took to, you know, basically get the knowledge just to form a basis to do science, which is a lot. I mean, it really is a lot, but um, it doesn't feel like work if you're, if you're really enjoying it, if you're really, you know, passionate about it. One thing I found fascinating reading the book mm -hmm. was that your younger brother Joey actually typically outscores you on like aptitude tests. Yeah. I, but has struggled to find like that thing he cares enough about to have the kind of success you've had. Yeah. I mean, I like to tell people that. I mean, I think Joey is, is smarter than me in pretty much every way. Like Joey <laughs> is a very smart uh, guy. Um, but unlike me, he, and still this point, I don't think has discovered what he really wants to use that aptitude for. Um, I was lucky, I found what I wanted to do when I was 10 years old. I don't think most people who are 25 or even 30 or 35 have discovered that yet. But I was just, and, and I think every day, like I am so lucky to have uh, the parents I had, to have the resources I had, and to discover that and have that spark when I was 10 years old. It, it's just about you know finding something that you really enjoy, um, whether you're 10 or, you know, 40, right? Um, it, it happens at different points for everyone. And what do you, do people ask you about like, how do I find my passion or how do I develop a passion at all? Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say for me. Um, people ask me, you know, how did I become, you know, interested in nuclear science? And, and it, it's hard to pinpoint, you know, one specific thing where it's like, I read that or I talked to that person and I knew. Um, I think more than anything, it was just being incredibly curious about the way the world worked, sucking in all the information I could about the natural sciences and physics and chemistry and engineering, mm -hmm. and then stumbling across nuclear science. And just for me being like, wow, this is kind of, to me, I think a combination of three things. One, it's really cool. It's like really powerful, right? Um, to me, nuclear science is the most interesting thing because it's, as humans, just about the most energy dense, um, process that we can access, right? Like the amount of energy contained in a gram of uranium relative, you know, to the massive amounts of fossil fuels that the energy in that uranium represents. Um, that's an incredibly powerful thing and that was really compelling to me. Um, so that was one pillar, if you will. You know, the other was um, aptitude. I kind of started to do it and I was like, hey, I'm kind of, I kind of got a knack for this, right? I got a knack for um, applying equations to, you know, designing um, experiments. That's the second pillar. And then the third pillar um, would be realizing that it was something I could do that I enjoyed that I thought I could make an impact with, right? Because 
Um, there are a lot of things we can do as hobbies that are fun, right? Like sports or um, a wide variety of activities. Um, but when you feel like you can make an impact, you know, a positive impact on the world using that, I think for me that's when it kind of all congealed that this is probably what I would be doing, you know, for at least the next 10 years, mm -hmm. if not longer. It's interesting that you bring that up. One of the most fascinating things about your story was the way that you reacted to your grandma getting cancer yeah. and then talk to us about that. How did that um, manifest itself in what you pursued? Yeah. And I think everyone when a terminal illness hits feels very helpless, right? Um, you feel like, you know, why has this happened? You know, there's not really much we can do, especially with the disease like cancer with, you know, the medicine of, of the time of the day. Um, but I kind of realized that nuclear science was a powerful tool and there existed opportunities within nuclear science, this whole field of nuclear medicine, to really make an impact on the way we treat and diagnose disease. And I think it was in that moment and because of that event that I realized that this was not only something that I would enjoy and have fun doing, but could also make an impact with. And it kind of gave a, a mission you know, kind of a mission to what I was doing. And uh, so that, uh, looking back, I think that was very formative and why I chose to do, you know, what I did. Um, yeah. I have two questions off that. One, do you, do you ever feel helpless? <laughs> I don't like feeling helpless. Uh, you know, if you really delve into my psyche and probably my mini neuroses, I, I think feeling helpless is not something I really enjoy. <laughs> I like to have, you know, uh, it's probably a, a control thing, I don't know. Um, but I'm very lucky that as a scientist and engineer that um, I can really take these tools of knowledge about the way the world works and apply them to solving problems. And I think that's the reason I am a very profound optimist. Like I am very optimistic about the future of humanity, about the future of this planet, about all the things we do, you know, as is, is dark as it seems sometimes and as miserable as this world can be and all the problems that we face, um, I have to remind myself that, you know, we are the one species on this planet that has the ability to use this thing, you know, our brain to overcome problems, right? Um, you know, any other animal on this planet, an asteroid is headed for Earth, they're gone, they're gone. Uh, but we exist as a species in this unique time um, in our evolution where we can change that. We could launch a rocket carrying nuclear weapons and divert the course of that asteroid. And that makes our species very unique, that ability to solve problems. And every day I get to meet um, very, very bright, very impressive people from all backgrounds and all walks of life who are working on solving these kind of problems. And when you do that, there's no way you can be pessimistic about the future. You've said that you have too many things you're interested in to tackle in one lifetime. How much does impact, so you talked yeah. about that with your grandmother, how much does impact factor into that decision making of how to rank sort of hierarchically the things you care about? Yeah, I mean, I'll just have to admit, like, I don't think I always do a great job of prioritizing what I do, right? <laughs> Sometimes I do it because it's, it's interesting. Sometimes I do it because I feel like you know, it'll inspire someone to do something else. Um, I don't do great at prioritizing it, uh, but I do try to think about what is the impact of what I'm doing, right? How does it contribute, whether it's um, engineering, whether it's solving a problem like energy or disease or security, or whether it's just simply, um, you know, doing science. And doing science for me is, you know, the most fun thing I do. The reason I ask that is yeah. for me, a lot of times, you know, people are, so I'll say you need to work hard, yep. smart, and long hours, right? That's my like obsession, those three yep. things. But what's hiding in that always and forever for me is yep. love what you do. Yep. Like once you love what you do, I'm not, like, I'm not saying go enslave yourself to the wheel of pain. Yep. I'm talking about something that you love doing. And there's a lot of stories in the book about where <laughs> you wouldn't eat, people would have to bring you food because you would just get so in Still on something. like that. <laughs> yeah. No, and it's true. I mean, it, when you do something you love, you kind of lose yourself in it sometimes. So going back to your profound optimism for the future, mm -hmm. um, one, what are you working on that you're most excited about that you think is gonna have the biggest impact? Yep. Um, and then what does our future look like? 
Well, the future is a very interesting place. I'll say that much. It's um, it's exciting. You know, it, it's always said that you know it, to predict the future is a very dangerous occupation, and, and I agree. You know, trying to predict, especially in the long term, where humans or civilization is going to be in two decades or three decades or four decades out, that that's very hard. You know, technology follows exponential trends, and it usually branches off from an area that most people or if anybody sees coming. Um, but what excites me, and partly why I do what I do, is because I get this little window into the future. You know, whether it's research that I'm doing, or um, someone I'm advising, or a group doing work that I've come in and, and kind of taken a look at, I get this very like early look at kind of what the next technologies that are on the horizon are, and uh, it's very exciting. I think um, as far as what I work on, and m the biggest part of my day job, you know, is energy. Um, the ability to create energy sources that are non-polluting, uh, that don't have emissions, that don't have harm to the environment, while at the same time being able to electrify the you know, one and fifth person on earth that doesn't have electricity, that's very exciting because there are literally billions of people on earth that don't have access to any electricity. And if you can provide that electricity to them at a lower cost and a, a much lower environmental footprint than what exists today, I think that's a very exciting future. Um, something that goes into that also or, or comes out of that is um, access to information, right? Um, I, I said this before, but what I was able to do at, t at 10 or 14 years old and growing up in Arkansas would not have been possible without the internet. It just wouldn't. Um, I would have been at the mercy of what was available at my local library, or if I was at a college campus, what was available in the you know libraries of, of that college uh, or university. And um, you know, you think about the one and fifth person on the planet that doesn't have access to any electricity. Um, once they have access to energy, it's a very logical step to get them telecommunications, to get them access to that internet of information. Um, and it's exciting to think about the people like me in places like rural India or sub-Saharan Africa that don't currently have access to the internet, that would be able to learn so much, become passionate about a subject, become well-versed in a subject, and then able to innovate the next major discovery that's gonna change our lives. So, of course, there are downsides to that, uh, downsides that'll need to be managed like all new technology, but the ability to electrify and integrate into the network of telecommunications we have today, those you know probably really several billion people is going to be incredible. And that's probably one of the things I'm most excited about. So I know that you've been working with Vice a lot, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually how you first got on my radar. My wife and I were watching a segment on energy okay. and they had you on it. And I'm like, who is this guy? Like I was obviously freaking out about the credentials and yeah. just how young you were. Um, what do you think is media's role in what you're trying to do? Bringing the youth voice, like, is that part of why you're focused there? Look, I think, you know, as, as far as, you know, some of the stuff like Vice that I've done and, and continue to do, I think the more that scientists communicate what they do to the public, the better off we are. You know, unfortunately, scientists aren't typically the greatest communicators. I mean, they're great at communicating with other scientists, but as far as communicating with the general public, right? Um, they're not great. And if you think about it, that's probably the one career field on earth that it's the most important to communicate. I mean, typically scientist funding comes from the public and the work they're doing directly impacts the citizen, the voter, the consumer. I mean, if you think about things as diverse from, you know, the environment to, to healthcare decisions, the, the research that scientists are doing are directly affecting, you know, the average person. And if there doesn't exist an ability to communicate that, you're kind of losing that knowledge to the place where it's, it's most important that it goes. And, um, and look, I think science is really, really cool. I mean, I, I think you would agree, um, you know, science is, is this amazingly cool thing. It happens with the biggest, coolest toys humans have ever built in some of the coolest places on earth by some of the coolest people. And mind you, not people that are, you know, seven-year-old white men with crazy hair and lab coats. I mean, it, it's a very diverse group of people that do science. And the more we communicate that and the more we enter that into the zeitgeist, into popular media and popular culture, the better off we're going to be because not only are citizens and the general public going to be better informed on the issues, 
but the more young people that are going to be inspired to go and do science. And, and in some ways, uh, I kind of hope that's my greatest legacy. I'm, I want to do a lot of really big things with my life. I'm very ambitious. Um, I will try to do as many as, as possible or I have the ability to do, um, but I can only do so much. But if I can inspire 100 kids or 20 kids to pursue science and technology as a career, the amount of innovation they'll be able to do, the amount of problems they'll be able to solve, and the amount of good they'll be able to do in the world, that's a force multiplier on what I'm able to do. And so in some ways, I'm more excited about that than you know, any of the work that I do, is being able to be that voice to go out and say, science is really flipping cool, and we should really do you know, something to promote this so young people realize that. All right, you said that you're really ambitious. There's a lot of things you want to do. What are other than energy, because I totally get it, loud and clear on energy, but beyond energy, um, what are a few key things that if you don't accomplish by the time that you uh, leave this earth, yes. or if you do me a favor and end aging, which I would really yes. appreciate, um, like what are those key things you're like, they just absolutely have to happen? Energy is kind of the biggest thing I focus on because energy underlies so many things we do. I mean, energy is the currency of our everyday lives. You know, the currency of our economies, the currency of manufacturing, the currency of healthcare, um, sustainable food production, water resources. All these things are basically just a function of energy. And if we can dramatically, like by an order of magnitude, lower the cost of energy, um, increase the access to energy, all while doing it in a very environmentally responsible and sustainable way. So um, you already have that design. Like, why isn't that happening? So the reactors are undergoing development. Um, development in like a, and now we have to get the government to buy in on it? Or development like, hey, the government's already bought in and now we're actually making them? Um, a lot of just basic r and I mean, building a reactor is a hard thing. Um, it's not as straightforward as going to Lowe's and like <laughs> picking up PVC pipe and a pump and things like that. Um, there are a lot of things with reactor development that require a lot of validation. You know, you have to subject materials to an environment for a prolonged period of time to mm. see how they're gonna perform. Um, I'm happy with the progress. I think it's gonna be something that is really gonna come of age soon enough to make a difference, especially in the specialty customers. You know, these reactors have the potential to be a utility scale solution, right? Um, but what I'm most excited about are those specialty customers. What keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? Well, that's a good question. Um, look, I think, you know, there are a lot of um, advantages to technology, right? Like we've created these amazing lives that, um, compared to lives a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago are um, prolonged, that are, are free from a lot of the, the problems that you know, our early ancestors faced, but they haven't been without their the downsides. You know, technology typically is always a two-headed coin, right? Um, uh, nuclear technology is the, the prime example of that, right? We created the ability to split the atom, uh, created the most destructive weapons humans have ever built, nuclear weapons. And it also created this technology, whether it's uh, nuclear power, whether it's nuclear medicine, whether it's some of the other applications of nuclear technology that really have made our lives better, have made really big advancements in the way um, we live our lives. Um, there are a lot of these so-called dual use technologies that I think going forward in the future, we have to keep an eye on. Um, Biotechnology is one of those. Um, the ability to synthesize an organism on command, uh, to basically be able to program its genetic code to serve a function is going to have profoundly impactful um, importance on our lives. I mean, the ability to synthesize drugs, the ability to synthesize new materials, the ability to um, treat disease and, and create a, a life of abundance is all going to be enabled by those kind of synthetic uh, biology uh, projects. But it also creates the possibility that you could create a designer bug, right? Uh, a, a, a disease um, a vector, a, a pathogen that could target an individual or could target a group or become way more pathogenic than something that exists today. And that's a scary possibility. Um, the same possibility exists with artificial intelligence. And we were talking about this earlier, but um, I don't know where I fall on the issue of general artificial intelligence. Um, narrow AI, narrow artificial intelligence, 
is relatively easy. You know, artificial intelligence applied to a problem, you know, whether that problem's security or that problem's healthcare or that problem's food management, you know, the, the application of artificial intelligence to that is much easier to not only know where it's going, but try to mitigate the risk and mitigate the, the, the negative consequences of it. General AI, this idea of super intelligence or, or um, a singularity or the ability to create a computer that exceeds the cognitive capacity of the human brain, um, that's something that's much harder to predict where it's going. And because it's harder to predict, it's harder to mitigate the negative you know, consequences of that. Um, I don't know where I fall in this issue. Do I think it's a doomsday scenario? Do I think it's a existential threat to human existence? Probably not. But I still think it's something that we have to keep an eye on. Um, just like you know, I, I, we were in 1939 with the dawn of the Manhattan Project and the dawn of a new era and understanding of our universe. Uh, we embarked on a crash program to develop nuclear weapons. And literally in a couple of years, we went from a theoretical concept to the ability to create the most destructive weapons humans have ever created. And um, in that way, I think we sort of stand like we stood in 1939 with nuclear weapons, uh, potentially with computing technology. Um, it will have positive outcomes. It will transform the way we live our lives in a positive way. It may also have negative outcomes. So it, it is, it is um, very important for the scientists doing the research, the organizations funding the research, and governmental bodies, whether those are national or international, to keep an eye on it, always reevaluating where the technology is going. Out of curiosity, if you have kids, what would you do to help them um, foster the kinds of passions and things that have been such a boon for you? Uh, look, I, I definitely want to have kids. Um, I'm excited to see what they do. In a way, I hope they don't do at least nuclear science, if, if science at all. Why is that? Um, I don't know. I think, uh, I think it's important for me, and, and I talked about this before, you know, I am so incredibly lucky to have lived the life I did. I think in, in a lot of other circumstances, I would have not ended up where I ended up. Um, the fact that I had parents that um, never tried to shepherd me into any certain area, they always kind of looked to me of what my interest was and tried to, to fuel that passion. Um, and like I said, that, that changed over the years and then I found nuclear science. Um, but that ability to support whatever my passion was and do it wholeheartedly and take me to space camp and take me to national labs to meet nuclear scientists and giving me a little bit of leeway when it came to doing experiments while still you know trying to keep me safe um, i think if i was born into a lot of other situations i wouldn't have had that um, so for me you know i i if i have kids when i have kids um, i would hope that they um, can develop their own passions and i can support that because i think they will be the most successful when they find something that they love and are able to use you know, what talents they may have um, on that. And um, so I'm excited about that future. How would you do that though? Is it like a shotgun approach of just making sure that they encounter a lot of different things or do you have a specific methodology? Well, I'm not a parent yet. Um, we'll, we'll see when I get to that point what my methodology is and I'm sure I'll have a perfect plan and how it actually turns out. <laughs> um, but yeah, look, I think um, partly it's, it's making sure and encouraging curiosity, right? So giving them access to libraries of information, giving them the access to the information, um, encouraging that curiosity. And then once they found something they were interested in, giving them as many resources as was humanly possible to pursue that. Um, you know, if they're interested in space, I'm gonna take them to space camp. I'm gonna make sure that that is a priority for me as a parent to get them there um, and expose them to people that are doing what they're, you know, what they're interested in. Um, I've always believed that it's very hard to be inspired to do something when you can't really see yourself doing it, right? Like if you're a, you know, um, young girl of color and the only scientific mentors you have are these old white guys in lab coats, it's going to be very hard to be like, you know what, I see myself in that person. I want to be a scientist. This is cool. Um, and I think in that way, um, getting young people exposure to science and what science actually is 
um, is important. So taking them to labs, showing them people doing the science and showing them kind of the diversity of the people that are doing science. I think that's very important because that's when that spark happens. Like, oh, that guy or that girl is kind of like me. You know, she, she looks like me and she's having a whole lot of fun doing what she's doing. I think that's what I want to spend my life doing. Um, I think that is an incredibly powerful um, and underutilized tool for, for inspiration. How do you respond when somebody in your lab says that something can't be done? <laughs> I usually question them very, very long and hard about that. And that happens, you know, like I'll, uh, whether it's a student, whether it's someone that I'm working with, you know, whether it's a colleague that, that, uh, that I've engaged in a partnership, um, sometimes people are like, Taylor, that just, that, that's not possible. And I guess every once in a while, especially if it starts to butt up against the laws of physics, that response might be valid. But I give them a long, hard look, a long, hard uh, questioning session of, is it really not possible? Or have you just not thought up a solution? Or have you not given it enough time? Or is that just the conceived way of thinking about the subject? You know, it's... it's um, uh, it goes back so so um, Elon Musk founded SpaceX in the early 2000s uh, because early on he had this idea that he wanted to send a greenhouse to Mars which is kind of a, a crazy idea uh, if you think about it uh, but this idea that streaming back the pictures would inspire people um, well now fast forward um, over a decade and SpaceX his space launch company has been able to create a class of reusable orbital booster really for the first time in the history of spaceflight, a fully reusable first stage orbital booster. Um, that's something that even maybe six or seven years ago, if you went to the rocket community and asked, people would say it's crazy. It's not the way things are done. It's probably not possible. And if it's possible, it's gonna be way too expensive to be economical. And Elon and the team at SpaceX was like, this is something that is important. This is how we're going to reduce launch of co uh, the cost of launch. It's crazy to be throwing away these boosters after every flight. That would be like throwing away jumbo jets after every transatlantic crossing. And they said, we're going to do it. And we're going to do it. And we're going to prove it's possible. And we're going to make the economics work. And I think it's thinking like that that is not always found within science, that's not always found within industry. And the more crazy folks you have that push people like that, the more kind of a radical innovation like reusable rockets will have. Because again, Elon didn't know what he didn't know, right? He didn't know that's not the way it's done. He didn't spend his career in a rocket company, in a propulsion company, doing rocket engineering, doing aerospace engineering. And so he didn't know that reusable orbital class vehicles wasn't the way things were done. And because of that, was able to create a company that is now doing that and has dramatically dropped the cost of launch to orbit. And so I try to encourage the people around me, just, you know, if you don't think it's possible, just give it another try, sketch it out, maybe try a different way. And if you come back to me again, or maybe, you know, three times from now and don't have a solution, then then maybe I'll, I'll accept that it's, it's just not gonna happen right now. All right, and how do you, I'm guessing in your career, you failed a lot. Oh, like, yeah creating some of the things you've created just seems inevitable. How do you think about failure? How do you deal oh, with failure? If I was in the lab today, I would probably fail. Um, I will have probably profound failures in the future. <laughs> Hopefully none that are, are large and dramatic and, and uh, uh, end up on the 12 o'clock, you know, the, the <laughs> 10 o'clock news. But um, inevitably I will have lots more failures, but that's what drives innovation. I mean, some of the coolest things I've done in the lab have been failing to do what I originally set out. My original hypothesis or my original experimental design turned out to be just completely worthless. I, I couldn't do it or I screwed it up, but the outcome was something that actually was kind of interesting. Um, that goes back to some of the greatest scientific discoveries in history came from people that had kind of really bad experimental design, but discovered something that they never intended, that they never thought of. Um, and so in that way, you know, people talk about, you know, failure being the catalyst of innovation or failure being, you know, the way we learn all this stuff. And nowhere is that more um, uh, uh, prominent than in science. I mean, science is built on failure. If I knew when I set out to conduct an experiment, what the outcome was gonna be 100%, there would be no reason to do the experiment. So a lot of times in science and in engineering too, um, you know, you're not going to succeed or you're not gonna 
prove your intuition. But what you do develop, what you do create, what you do discover is going to probably be something, in some cases, even cooler than what you set out to do. Um, so yeah, fa failure is integral. And I know people say that all the time. That's almost become a buzzword. Like you have to fail to succeed and all this stuff. But like that is a core tenant to science is, um, you know, we, you have to remain curious. Like if you get convinced that you know everything and that you know, you know, everything about what you're doing and you stop being curious, that's the moment you stop becoming, you, know, you stop being a scientist. I mean, to be a scientist is to not know. Um, it's the probably only profession on earth where you were rewarded for not knowing what you're doing. Um, and so um, maybe it's a good excuse, but I think it's a whole lot of fun as a job. I love that. All right, before I ask my last question, where can these guys find you online? Um, that's a good question. Um, I try to kind of, uh, uh, not spend too much time on social media, um, but um, I, I do have a website and probably in the future we'll be, you know, kind of updating or at least restarting some of these social media channels because um, I think what I do on a daily basis is cool to look at. So uh, one of these days I need to start, you know, getting that out there and I'll let you know when I do. All right, sounds perfect. Final question, okay. what is the impact that you want to have on the world? Well, look, I think there are a lot of things I want to do. Uh, we've kind of touched on a lot of them. I think energy, you know, if we can really reinvent the way we use and produce energy, that's going to be probably more transformative than a lot of the things that I can do with my life. So if I can have a, at least a small part in kind of transforming our energy economy, that'll be important. Um, but more than that, I think, you know, if, if we can inspire a new generation of young people to pursue science and technology as a way to make the world a better place, that'll have more of a profound impact on the world than anything else. Because science is cool. And science is the one thing I think that's really gonna get us out of these problems that we face today. You know, we, we're in a rut. Like we have some big problems that we face domestically and internationally and in the globe in general. And um, science and technology represents the tools to get us out of those holes, to dig ourselves out of these problems and really make the world a you know, better place in the future than it was in the past. Um, so the more young people that are working on that and getting to use these really cool, sexy toys, um, the better the world's going to be. And so if I can have a part in that, that would be something I would, I would try to do. Awesome. Taylor, thank yeah. you so much for coming yeah. on the show, man. That yeah. was incredible. Yeah. Guys, all right, on this one, I'm telling you the notion of profound curiosity. That is something I want you to burn into your soul. What I love is this guy is the one telling you that aptitude matters, but it doesn't matter nearly as much as you think. And if he was gonna have to trade it for something, and the funny thing is in his family, he has the examples where his brother was actually outscoring him on all the aptitude tests that they were taking. But because he had that thing, he had that passion that he had discovered. He had the profound curiosity which he used to get mentors, which he used to propel himself forward. All of that, that was the real juice. Cultivate that in yourself. Go out, encounter a lot of stuff. Let his story be the story of that. Let people right now that don't know what they want to do really look at that and think about what are the ways that you can engage with something to discover the things that you really want to do in your life then don't take no for an answer. Show his level of tenacity, get after it, convince people, persuasion. This guy is able to persuade people and I think more than anything with his infectious enthusiasm for what he does. Fall in love with something, get really good at it, put in the time and effort, don't take no, rethink, get outside your comfort zone, think about other things, come at it from a new angle, and what he said about failure is incredibly awesome and it may be oft repeated, but it is literally the foundation of so many things, not just science, but hearing it from somebody who's had that level of success to say literally what I do is all about failure is pretty incredible. I hope you guys were listening as closely as I was. All right, boys and girls, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Taylor, thank you, man. Yeah, you that was awesome. Really, really cool. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching and being a part of this community. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. You're gonna get weekly videos on building a growth mindset, cultivating grit, and unlocking your full potential.